they brought a complete championship back just for me ultimately so like uh, yeah that's going to be a highlight not even in just nxt but my entire career what's up everybody welcome back to another episode of out of character i'm your host of course ryan satin and i am here once again so that you can learn more about a wwe superstar who they are off camera who they are in real life and this week we've got cameron grimes a guy whose career i have been following since like forever i feel like i've been watching him forever at this point it was a huge fan of his on the indies huge fan of his in nxt and now he's on the main roster on smackdown had a huge debut beating baron corbin and it felt like the perfect time to bring him in here and pick that brain a little bit so i hope you guys enjoy my conversation with new smackdown superstar cameron grimes cameron grimes thank you so much for joining me today i appreciate it very much yeah, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having me. So I want to start this off asking you what I ask everyone else when I start off the show, and that's how much of your real true self is there in the character that you're currently playing on TV? I think there's a, a lot of my current true life in the character. Uh, it, it really hasn't changed much, you know what I mean? It's just I have a, just a hard-working country boy, right, that kind of got lucky and struck it rich and and I was kind of taking advantage of that. But ultimately, my dream is to always be in the WWE. So, I, you know what I mean? I think that's very near and dear to who Trevor Cadell is or is Cameron Grimes. You know what I mean? But I think it's pretty hands on. I don't know. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'm someone who's followed your career for a long time now. And I think that it does seem to me that this is the most like grounded you've been as you as a character. You're not maybe outlandish as much you're kind of so far a much more grounded like you on on tv at least since you've been on smackdown right uh, i feel like initially when the uh when when cameron grimes kind of became a thing i had to be kind of over the top and and kind of outlandish like that because at the time it, if you were watching uh the nxt brand uh it was at the time when everybody was just so skillful uh, or you know what i mean good at everything that they did so there wasn't a lot of characters that were over the top or, or, or raising their voice or, or being uh, outlandish, if you will. So I feel like at that time, Cameron Grimes really needed to do that to stand out uh, amongst the current roster that we had at the time. I think that it's uh, your ability to rile up a crowd just on the mic is underrated because I've seen you really get under people's skin at like an indie show or something like that and i feel like you've really only gotten to scratch the surface of how much you can make people dislike you uh, as a character right uh yeah you definitely got to see me uh in a lawless land um and now we are in a land that has laws <laughs> uh i think it's the best way that we could uh we could say that uh but yeah i think that but and also in turn, I also instead of using that energy to get people to dislike me, I think I used some of that energy to get people to like me uh, during that million dollar run. So, uh, but again, it, it all comes back to the law. So then you said uh, country boy who got lucky, who's hardworking. That's kind of how you would describe yourself, the person. Uh, yeah, hundred uh, percent. You know, from from Cameron, North Carolina. Uh, it's funny, Cameron Grimes uh, from Cameron, North Carolina, and the Grimes is, I mean, you remember seeing me on the shows. I was, you know, scraping every penny I could to make it across the country to be able to follow that blueprint, which is like uh, to continue to get better in this business. Uh, I wasn't a college athlete. You know what I mean? I didn't go to school to be a professional football player or baseball player. My goal was to always be a professional wrestler, a sports entertainer, a WWE superstar. So, uh, you know what I mean? I scratched and clawed that whole way there, and, and uh, I got lucky, but I also kind of deserve it in some credit. Uh, you, you were there in Reseda. You know how hot it was in August. Uh, you know what I mean? We, we There was a lot of sweat and tears and blood put into it, and, and I think that is Cameron Grimes right now. Well, that's why I asked the luck. I actually specifically wanted to ask about the lucky part. That's why I specified that, because I do think as someone – who watched you grow as a performer from the Reseda Hall of PWG to where you are now, I don't think it's luck. I do think that you're a very skilled person, and I feel like you've been a student of the game since you were a kid because of the fact that your dad was a wrestler even back then. Yeah, 100%. Uh, 
I'm kind of cursed, right? Uh, my fondest memories are the wrestling ring, uh, surrounded by the Hardy Boys, surrounded by uh, all those legends that came out of the North Carolina area in the 90s. Uh, some would even say that that area inspired, like, what, what became the style that is today, like that that crazy high spot style. Like, uh, some would even argue that that has a lot to do with the North Carolina area. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm gifted and I'm cursed at the same time because after seeing that, how was I going to do anything else? Uh, that's the problem. Were you, so growing up, were you fairly close with the Hardy Boys even as a kid? Yeah, 100%. Like, my father started a uh, mega wrestling is what it was called at the time with Matt Hardy. So uh, the ring that was used to run those shows was in my yard. Uh, so like, I remember going to elementary school and people knew who I was because I was the house in town that had a wrestling ring in the yard. So like, it's always been there and it's always been what I've wanted to do. That's crazy. Like, so yeah. can we, how old are you right now? I'm 29. 29. I will be 30 this year, September 30th. So you didn't, so the Attitude Era, you were fairly young during the Attitude Era when they were on TV and stuff? Yeah, for sure. Uh, when they had won the WWE titles, the WWE Tag Team titles for the first time, I think I was around maybe like, what, seven or eight years old. So that's, fairly young. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely young. So I can imagine, yeah, that that explains why, you know, this has been a thing for you for so long and why it's been something that you've been passionate about. I mean, when you have two huge guys from your town that you have such a connection to the backyard that they trained in, you know, the, the ring they trained in, in your backyard, uh, of course, it's going to inspire you to want to follow in those footsteps. Yeah, hundred percent. And not even just the same town. We lived on the same street. Crazy. Uh, yeah. My grandmother lived on the same street as them. And from sixth grade, uh, me and my father moved in with my grandmother. So from sixth grade until I graduated high school, I was next door neighbors with the Hardy boys. So, you know what I mean? So it's just hard to, to just think that that it's not normal that I can't make it to the WWE because I'm seeing these guys from the same street as me become legends, Hall of Famers. Yeah, see, it's yeah. A lot of times you hear people say like, "Oh, I'm from the small town," and people would say, "Oh, you can't do that," or, or "You can't make it out to there," or whatever. But you're like, "Well, the proof is on my street, dude. I definitely yeah, can." It, it was the exact opposite for me, right? Because like it's right there in front of me. It, it's such an obtainable thing. Yeah, I always say, like, I, you know, I think I had the advantage of living in Los Angeles. So, like, it's a lot easier for me to, like, follow a dream to try and be on camera and stuff. But, you know, I really do have respect for people who do come from a small area that are able to make those sacrifices uh, to get there. It's, it's, it's definitely impressive. So, okay, I was wondering, before I get too much into the wrestling, we're still talking about you, the person. Um, you were, you actually were into stocks, right? That's, that was real, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Still am. Yeah, I was gonna uh, ask. You're still in the socks. So, yeah, hundred percent. So, uh, yeah, we never had anything. Like my my dad, uh, he was a salesman, like car salesman, and like he worked long hours to try to support us. And and uh, so there wasn't a lot of saved money. So I I didn't know what to do with money. And, and even like before I got to WWE, like I didn't have money. Like even though I was traveling the world and like being an independent wrestling superstar. I didn't have money. I just was able to like kind of pay for my rent, pay for my food and, and kind of survive. But then like the luxury of WWE was that, you know, the paycheck comes every single week, even if you're, even if you're not wrestling that week. So like it, it helps a lot and it's wonderful. So I was trying to figure out now I have a little bit of money saved. What, what do you do with it? And like uh, looking at a savings account in your bank, is just disgusting. You're like watching you put tons of money in there and you make a, a penny off of it. So it's just like disgusting. Well, but, but how did the rich get rich? You know what I mean? Like they, they got, they got to be able to do something like they're doing something. So then I just started kind of playing with the stock market and seeing stuff. And uh, then kind of right around that time, like COVID happened, but before that was the whole like GameStop and everything thing. And, and like, there had been like murmurs and stuff about this. So I kind of was like, okay, let's gamble. You know, ultimately it's a gamble. And then it, exploded uh not even GameStop but like AMC and everything and then like so I was just like whoa and like you you saw the beginnings of the uh, of me as a character so like you know like it was kind of a bland kind of basic caveman character yes so, but I, I'd always kind of jokingly said like wouldn't it be hilarious if like one day I just was rich like 
if, if one day all of a sudden I just could be rich and had it all. And it was always just kind of a joke. And then, then the stock market thing kind of happened and it like almost really happened. So I was just like, guys, like I had taken a break for, to have like a knee scope surgery, just to get it a little cleaned up. So we had some down period and I was like, I think if we should try this and then we tried it and they got me a Lamborghini night one. And Damn. ever since then it was the rocket ship. It felt like that's so crazy though. So you were on like the Reddit forums figuring out what everyone was going to be doing basically. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, I started to see a little bit of the growth. Like I started to see a little bit of the trend start to take off. So I was like, maybe this is happening. And I, at the time, I was just kind of like, you know what? I don't want to miss out. Like, I'm tired of being like those people. Are like, oh, I, I could have done this. Like, should have so bought Bitcoin like, you know when I could have. That those kind of people. Yeah, yeah. So I just like pulled. A, I had some stuff and other things. So I just pulled it all out and just dumped it into that. Damn. And then literally overnight, it was five times of what I bought it at, and I, it was shocking. <laughs> oh my, I least. can't imagine waking up and seeing that. Just like the the, the look that you must have had on your face. Right, right. And then even like the Dogecoin, like that was a, uh, I remember like a year before it, it had popped off, like we were looking at the crypto stuff, just me and my friends. It was like a July 4th weekend or something like that. And, you know, like we were celebrating that weekend and we were said the same thing. Like, why didn't we buy Bitcoin when we originally heard about it? Like we missed out. So we were just looking through the things and we're like, oh, this is funny. This one's called Dog Coin. Like, this is hilarious. And it wasn't even like a penny at the time. Like it was like a percentage of a penny. So we just bought some of it. And then a year later, it was, you know what I mean? Like 50 cent Dang. a piece. And that's like dramatic growth. Dang. But just all from just silly lucky. That's it. I mean, that's what a lot of the luck in that is brought up with because that's 100% just luck. Got it, it took no skill at all. And that luck is going to like help your life for so long now, basically. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. I also like stocks are one of those things I wish I could get into because my wife, her her grandpa was a like a wealthy man who then just made so much money in the stock market to where he was just set for life just from, you know, what right. he did in the stock market. And it really is like one of those things like you said, that's how the rich get richer. 100%. And you know, a lot of it to the easiest thing I can think of is like uh, if you're just optimistic, like whatever you're putting your money into right now, it's going to go up. You know what I mean? Because if you're optimistic in life, like the world's only going to get better, hopefully. So like in theory, your money's only going to go up. So just buy whatever you want and it, it'll be all right. So then now <laughs> that, okay, now that some of those, the stonks thing isn't really happening as much, do you have like a broker or anything like that that you've helped that or is it all you still? Yeah, still all me. Uh, you know what I mean? It, it's it like I said, it's it's kind of easy to just see like what everybody does. Like right now, I have like Apple headphones in my ear. So like, why wouldn't I have a piece of Apple? Uh, everybody likes Starbucks. So why you know what I mean? Why wouldn't you invest in these companies that you see everybody messing with every single day? So like, it seems like it's rocket science, but ultimately, it's it's really not. So like I just kind of invest in like huge tech companies like that's what I've been kind of in since since the whole stonk craziness like I'm not really looking for exponential growth at this moment but I'm looking at stuff that I can just kind of keep there and that's going to crush a stupid savings account if we learn anything from this podcast today is get rid of your savings account <laughs> <laughs> noted that's what I'm taking away from this podcast I'm asking for myself here I'm like I gotta figure out what this guy's doing yeah, yeah. over yeah. here. Uh, so we mentioned PWG earlier. Uh, do you do you feel like that time in PWG is what got you on the map, kinda? A thousand percent. Um, I was uh, a guy trying to uh, make my name in the Indies. Uh, not even a guy. I was a child at the time. I was eighteen years old, and I was doing like tryouts for other companies, trying to like be seen in these other companies. Or, you know, the the Ring of Honors, the the, the, the stuff like that. And uh, I was just an 18 year old kid. So like I had, I had potential, but uh, people didn't really want to invest in uh, an 18 year old kid. And, and I actually got lucky in Charlotte, North Carolina. There was a show that uh, Kevin Owens was on at the time. 
and Kevin Owens, you know, I mean, historically, if you know Kevin Owens, you know PWG. They, you know, they wore the logo on the gear at WrestleMania this year when they WrestleMania the biggest WrestleMania in history. So he's seen me wrestle in, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina against Cedric Alexander, you know, another WWE talent at the time. And he said that he thought the match was good. He thought that we would both be good in PWG. And, uh, that made my life. You know what I mean? I was watching PWG tapes at the time. I was watching all that at the time. And that's ultimately what I wanted to do. Uh, but I didn't think that was a possibility because at the time to wrestle for PWG, you had to be one of those super indie guys. You had to be like already kind of traveling the world. You don't just get brought out to PWG and wrestle on PWG like that. That just doesn't happen. Uh, so we kind of left that interaction with nothing happening. Uh, you know, I mean, I had I never saw Kevin again up until this next point. But so then a year later, Cedric Alexander hits me up. I'm like coming home from the beach or something. And he says, uh, hey, I need your email. And at the time, no one asked for my email. Uh, no one no one needs my email. I never gave anybody my email because I'm not getting bookings like that. And uh, fair enough. I'm like, OK, well, I send her my email. And I'm like, what's going on? Like, why do you need my email? And he said, uh, not exactly sure yet, but I think we might be booked for PWG this weekend. And it's like Wednesday. <laughs> so I'm like, what? Like, what do you mean? Like, what do you mean? Like, we're in North Carolina. So first of all, I got to go all the way across the country and, uh, for a Friday. What do you like? How does this happen? And sure enough, I just get flight information for a flight to Los Angeles. Damn. So I'm just like, this is insane. What At 18 is happening? years old. That's crazy. Yes. So I'm just like, this is insane. So we end up going there. We go to PWG, uh, and it's uh, Mystery Vortex is a show that they call it. And, and the big deal about that is everything is a mystery. No, There is no advertised matches. There is nothing. Uh, so myself, Cedric Alexander, and a close friend of mine, uh, Andrew Everett, had a triple threat match on PWG to start the show. And uh Cedric Alexander and Andrew Everett were a little bit known from working Ring of Honor at the time but no one knew who I was at all and I, I don't know if you were there or not Oh right I was 100% now. there and yeah 100% Yeah I, I thought you would have yep. been yeah 100%. you were you're always at all of them <laughs> and uh I, I definitely remember coming out the curtain and people being like who are you who are you whatever but the match went so wild there was actually an earthquake during the match i don't know if you remember no, that i do remember line, that 100 an earthquake yes that happened during the match yes. and we had no idea because the crowd was going bonkers and if you've ever seen any old pwg clips the crowd would bang on the ring and make all this crazy noise and excitement and i remember just coming back to the back just like so high just like like on fire like electricity just like holy crap like I think we just did something special there. Like, I think that we like might have solidified ourselves at something. Like, like our our whole goal out of that was to try to get booked for Battle of Los Angeles out of that. And out of that, it ended up spiraling to that one interaction, that one booking. From that point on, I was booked every weekend after that, all across the world, being flown to every state. You know what I mean? All because of that one match and that one interaction. It was insane. Well, it's a good thing you got to go to the beach before you were busy every weekend after that. You know? yeah. <laughs> and actually, God, it's so crazy to hear you talking about that because that you like just took me back to a t like a like a memory that I hadn't even thought about in so long. But I, I do remember that very vividly, and I remember that's what one of my favorite things about Mystery Vortex is when they would bring someone out that you didn't know. And at, at the beginning, they'd kind of be doing the, like, who the hell is this guy? And by the end, they're chanting, please come back for those people. Like, that's when you knew you got those people. And so, um, yeah, God, I, that's crazy that was your first match because I very much – at PWG – because I very much remember that. And I think that also – I don't think I knew that it was Kevin who, you know, kind of put in the word or said that that, that you'd be someone that'd be good in PWG because yeah. I'll never forget – that you beating Kevin is really what puts you on the map. Like in his in his farewell match at PWG, like you said, he's like a mainstay at PWG, wearing it at WrestleMania this year. And the fact that you beat him in his farewell match there was huge for you. Yeah, I was blown away at uh, the opportunity that that was given there. Uh, 
based out of that triple threat match, you know, it spiraled into a six man tag against Kevin and the, the young bucks. And, and at the time, you know what I mean? Those are the three top guys in that company. So for us three new guys to be coming in and being able to be put up against them that we couldn't have asked for any more. Uh, we couldn't ask for any bigger opportunity. And actually there's like a, a little side story I want to tell about this PWG thing, because do. I don't know if it'll ever get talked about ever again. But uh, actually when I was 16 years old in North Carolina, Brian Kendrick and Paul London had a seminar in North Carolina. And I remember my dad made like an uh, envelope, a manila envelope, like a resume and like promo pictures and even like a, a DVD in it that had highlights of like me versus Andrew Everett matches. And I remember I gave this to Brian Kendrick as a 16 year old kid and said, if you would, would you please take this to the promoter of PWG and give him this? There's no way like that would have ever happened. But I was in PWG for about three years at the time. And the promoter of PWG texts me and says, hey, I just checked the trunk of my car and there was a folder in there. And I opened it up and it was a resume for you. So like, I Is just want to put it Is this Super Dragon there, who was telling you this? Yeah. So, so he, he still had there. it in his trunk? That's awesome. Right. Yeah. So Brian Kendrick flew all the way from North Carolina to California and gave a 16 year old's resume to the promoter of PWG. And somehow that kid ended up working for PWG. And it's just, it's wild. I, I don't, I just, I just really wanted to share that story. What's funny too is like, let's see, what year would that have been? I feel like that would, let's see, you were 16, 18. So it wasn't that long, which means, because a lot of times when you hear those stories, the internet wasn't as prevalent, but you technically could have probably just emailed that to Super Dragon, you know? Yeah, maybe. Uh, but the fact that Brian yeah, was actually very took it on the with, plane yeah. with him, took it out there, like the effort is crazy. It is crazy. And then, and like flash forward even now, like Brian Kendrick was a big help in me getting into WWE. So like, I was just putting it out there, Brian Kendrick's a pretty good guy. <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, when you, when you look at those times to now, you can see the growth that you've had as a performer. You mentioned the the caveman thing and how you were, you know, we were talking about you healing it up for the crowd. But I think that you kind of having to, when you come into WWE, you kind of having to do more of the TV kind of stuff, get more of a different character going, has helped you grow as a performer a lot, I feel like. Yeah, 100%. Um, and I feel like I've, I've always kind of... Uh wanted that i've always wanted something kind of like attached to because uh, i feel like i've always kind of been talented you know I, i'll keep using these quotes throughout the whole podcast because i don't want to like blow myself up you're but, talented it's uh, fine yeah you know what i mean like I, I have the athletic ability to be able to do the the wrestling maneuvers that i can do and but uh i've always needed something that people can like hook on to uh like if when i talk to people uh I feel like I have a good interaction with people. I feel like people get along with me well. I feel like I can make people laugh and stuff like that. But I didn't know how to like translate that into a wrestling character or uh, whatever that may be. So just being able to like start fresh with the Cameron Grimes, it, it kind of helped me uh, kind of add layers to that character. Would you say that that's kind of the biggest difference between like, let's say like an impact and NXT for you, where you got to like add those layers with NXT? Uh, yes and no. Uh, you know what I mean? A lot of it too is uh, just kind of the growth as you are uh, as an, a person, right? Uh, I, in impact, I was, you know, really early twenties. Uh, you know, I didn't know who I was either, uh, but it wasn't because like, they didn't allow me to show the growth. They would have allowed me to show that. I just didn't, I don't think had it in me at the time to be able to uh, unlock those different layers, if you will. Who are some of the people at NXT behind the scenes that helped you unlock those layers? Uh, oh, that's a great question. So I think just having the greatest, like, mindset, if you will, like, kind of backing you kind of helps a lot like triple h you know sean michaels william regal like these guys are are telling me that uh you know what i mean they can see the talent in me like you know what i mean so like just being gassed up like that if you will by by people that you really trust like i'm a firm believer that uh the right people can see the right things uh 
I don't know how to really explain that more than what that is, right? But so just being able to have that confidence of like, okay, well, if these guys trust me and and kind of see that uh, I could do it, if you will, so then that just kind of gives me the, the ability to just be like, okay, well, I'm not going to get embarrassed. I'm just going to try this. And, and worst case that happens is the sun's going to rise the next morning. Was it a little embarrassing initially to try and do some of those things? Uh, so for, with me, like a lot of the embarrassment comes with like practicing this stuff. Like if, if like, if the camera's not on, I'm extremely embarrassed doing the camera and grind stuff. But the second the red light turns on, you know what I mean? I, it, I'm just camera and grind. So it, it is what it is. So, uh, yeah, that's, I don't know. That, that makes sense. I think that, <laughs> I, I, I think, it, I do think that it's very hard though to be for some people to be themselves on camera when there are these outlandish people that sometimes turning that light on does kind of uh make them you know pull back a little bit right and, and a lot of the start of that camera grind saying was like if i got embarrassed it kind of made it better like you know the whole ted debiasi stuff like he was embarrassing me the whole time and you know what i mean that kind of that kind of started the whole that damn ted debiasi thing so like you know it's fine to be embarrassed it means you're out of your comfort zone and and I don't think anybody's truly comfortable at doing this, right? Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. I've had to learn that even in interviewing. I'm like, I'm always going to be nervous when I do these. There's Even if I've talked right. to the person a million times, like I'm still going to be uh, nervous when I do these things. You, uh, you mentioned Ted DiBiase there. Uh, just how cool was it to work with the Million Dollar Man? You know, so cool. Uh, so like we had discussed earlier, like I kind of grew up, uh, I, was, I was young in the attitude area. So like, I didn't grow up watching Ted. So never in my life would I. If, when you when when you're making your creator wrestler and and SmackDown versus Raw or whatever, and you're making your vision board of how that career is going to go. Uh, and on my vision board, I never had riding in a Rolls Royce with Ted DiBiase on that vision board. It's just kind of a thing that came out of left field. But then once it was there, like I, I just had to take full advantage of it. Ted was the man, and we went to so many cool locations that only I feel the WWE can get for you and do for you. Like I'll probably never drive a Rolls Royce again. I would really love to, but the fact that I got to do that with the WWE and Ted DiBiase made it so cool. So like, you know, I, I could never ask for a better opportunity than we got to do with that. I, and I think that, you know, getting to be with someone like a Ted DiBiase who, is so dialed into his character. Uh, I think that it had to help you a little bit to like have that to play off of, I imagine. For sure. And then uh, even him just being able to give me a little bit of advice when we're in between takes and stuff like that. And just kind of uh, being able to help me, you know what I mean? He's been doing promos for 30 years at least. Right. So, so it was nice to just, you know, have more people that can be in your ear and just kind of give you different ways of doing different things. Is there any advice that you remember specifically or anything that he told you that stuck with you? Just to kind of stay strong. You know what I mean? Like uh, this business could be tough and you know what I mean? You can be, there could be very high highs and there could be very low lows and you just got to know how to be able to handle those and be able to uh, maintain and stay in this business. Do you think that was the highlight of your time in NXT that, that time, that feud and period? Yeah, for sure. I, uh, you know what I mean? I don't think it can get any bigger. Of course, you know, I would have loved to have uh, wrestled for the NXT championship and, and maybe have held that. But they brought an entire championship back, the million dollar championship. Uh, well, out of 11 year, 12 year absence, they brought a complete championship back just for me, ultimately. So, like, uh, yeah, that's going to be a highlight, not even in just NXT, but my entire career. And I think there's actually surprisingly like a lot of people who have succeeded on the main roster that were in NXT that never won the NXT title. So maybe, you know, maybe it's not the worst thing that it never happened, you know? Right, right, right. Of course. What did you think about the part switch? Part of the blueprint, though. Yes, part of the blueprint, for sure. Uh, what did you think about the switch to NXT 2.0? Uh, yeah, that was, um, you know, very interesting, uh, to be honest. I feel like if, if you were a fan of the product at the time, uh, I feel like... I was gearing up, like you said, 
the character kind of started as a very outlandish over the top character. Uh, but then I started kind of gearing into a more serious and more real life uh, side of, of who I am. And then right at that time is when the NXT 2.0 thing started. So uh, I feel like a lot of the, the time and the emphasis was put on a lot of the newer up and coming people that we were trying to establish all the new stars because uh, you know, the, a, a lot of our talent had moved and now there was a lot of spots that needed to be filled. So you have to establish these new characters. You have to give these people new time. So, you know, it was a very weird transition period, but, you know, ultimately that's where I always wanted to be. I always wanted to be at WWE. So it didn't matter if it was one, two, three. I was, you know, I mean, I was there and I was going to do my job to the best of my ability. Well, I think you were in a unique position too, because I think that the switch did want to kind of put an emphasis on some of the younger talent rather than the indie talent that, you know, the original NXT had been putting a big emphasis on. But you kind of are in the middle there because you are still a young guy, but you are someone who was a prominent indie talent. So you kind of like were in this like weird limbo. Right. Yeah. hundred uh, percent. You know, I'm, I, I feel like, I feel like I was the one of the last of that uh, that that era of that PWG. You know, PWG still happens now, but it, at you as a fan of the company, you've been there through the years. You've seen it. There was a special era there at that time, and I feel like I was one of the last guys that got to see just a little bit of that last little bit of the era. But at the same time, ultimately, I've always wanted to be a WWE superstar, and and even uh, even when I was working for PWG, I was working for Impact Wrestling, so I was I was already kind of learning the the television style. Uh, so I feel like that's the best thing about me ultimately is that you couldn't just label me as, as that super indie guy, like you said, uh, because I was trying to show also that I can be that WWE superstar, that sports entertainer, whatever that side of it is as well. So, uh, is that due from age maybe? Cause I'm still kind of young and can be molded into kind of whatever, but, uh, ultimately I just want to do whatever is best for the the job at the time whatever the company needs that's kind of always been what i've done and even at pwg you saw it like uh we were bringing in all the international talent across the world that's why i started cutting those promos that's why i kind of started talking like that because like i had to uh set myself apart and i had to make my my matches different than all these other guys that were going insane wild you know what I mean? I gave something different that you could remember as well. I, I'll never for like the the sound of you bragging to be about being an impact superstar just like just always stays in my head. I'm like I'm waiting for the day when you get to brag about being, you know, when you get to do that as a heel, like I'm a WWE superstar, you know, like That's respect right. <laughs> me. Uh was the haircut and the beard trim something that you just wanted to do or was something that they suggested to kind of change things up? How did that come about? For sure. Uh, you know, it was, it's always been suggested since day one. Uh, it, it's always been suggested. And, and ultimately like the, the hair and the beard, it all got grown out because like I said, I didn't have any money. Like I couldn't afford to go get haircuts and stuff like that. So then it kind of became that look, that caveman look, but yeah, they, uh, they had suggested, you know, like cleaning me up, um, especially in the NXT 2.0 start, they wanted to clean me up a little bit. And, uh, you know, I was open to it. I, I'm open to anything. I, I've said before, like I want any kind of uh, any kind of suggestion towards my character is great. Uh, if you look at the best actors, you know what I mean. They're not. Some of them are the same actor in every movie, but they get different directions, and then that ultimately makes their characters so much better throughout their careers because they went through these different ranges. And I feel like that's what I want. I want to be able to like go out of my comfort zone and uh, be given something to try to work towards because I feel like ultimately that'll make me better. Totally makes sense. Absolutely. Uh, and it's funny you say that about the haircuts thing. Cause yeah, that's so true. That's why for so long I had a crazy beard and stuff. I was but, like, but I don't want to go now, get a cut. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I am I'm need to get a little bit of a trim, but I think it looks pretty good. You yeah. Know? yeah you can. Uh, it looks fine. It <laughs> looks all the riches, Ryan. <laughs> Well, you can wait till you're at SmackDown, and then they'll cut it for you there, so you're all good. That's right. That's that's right. That's right. <laughs> and, you know, I like to keep the long hair, too, because it helps remind me of that. You know what I mean? It helps keep me kind of grounded and show that. You know, I mean, I was a bum at one point. You know, so, like, so, and as well, as long as I still got this thick hair, I want to keep it. There's people, you know what I mean, that 
fight over this thick hair. Pay a lot of money for hair like that, so you might as well keep it. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, okay, so your last match in NXT, I think it was back in November, but you didn't debut on the main roster until this month. Was this just a matter of waiting for the right creative these last six months or so? Yeah, 100%. I mean, uh, again, if... It, it, it's it's easy speaking to you because I know that you're a fan and I know that you're watching the product. You know, it's not just like a random person that I have to try to explain this to. But if you've watched our product in the past year, it's incredible. It's on top of its game. And like you said, my last NXT match was in November. Around that time, we're gearing up to go to the Royal Rumble. We're gearing up to go to WrestleMania. Uh, and like I said, if you've watched our product, that whole stint to going into the rumble and going into wrestlemania there has been incredible segments that's been happening on television and and i think i would be insane to to say like you know what let's cut five minutes from this bloodline segment to establish cameron grimes right here so you know i mean i feel like it, it is all it was all timing and and I definitely took that down period of time and got in the best shape of my life you know i've, I've taken advantage of the pc uh they have we were talking about this a little before they have everything. Like if you've ever watched Rocky, like the scene where Drago's like in the gym and he's got like all the, the equipment hooked up to him and the breathing tubes and they're like perfectly scientifically doing it. That's what they're doing at the PC now. So I've just been completely taking advantage of that and getting ready because I knew that I am at the pinnacle. Now I am at the top. There is no higher Ryan. You saw me at the bottom when the, the super Indies, you know what I mean? There is no higher. I, I cannot go any higher now. So the only thing I can do now is stay here and try to make the most out of it. I actually, I even went further back in your career when I was researching for this. I was like, well, I've seen him in PWG. I found a match of yours from like 2009 where you've got like the spiky hair and you're like this little scrawny kid wrestling like a Willow the Wisp, uh, uh, not Jeff Hardy. It's like a knockoff of Willow the Wisp. Yeah. And, and I was like, man, to see that, to, to that, you know, is so cool, you know. And I'm for those of you listening, I'm pointing at a picture of him on SmackDown now. But uh, the progression is just awesome. And, yeah, dude, the shape that you've gotten in for this is amazing. Like, I can imagine – did you – how? what's your body percent – what's your body fat percentage? you know all those kinds of things now that you're all ripped? Right, right, right. Yeah, so that, they definitely have that, and they, they, they judge that. I'm sitting at 13% right now, so, you know – there's people that are going to hear that and, and be like, oh, that's great. But then there's people that are going to hear it and go, oh, he's fat. So it just depends on what side of the which side of the social uh, you're on there. Depends but, on uh, if you have abs or not. If you have, you yeah, know. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I, you know, I feel great. I feel healthy, uh, and that's really all that matters is is my health because uh, doing this, what it's going to be 50 weeks out of the year, 52 weeks out of the year. Uh, ultimately we have to stay healthy uh this isn't like the nfl where we have 16 weeks where we have to hit it hard and then we get to take a break we have to be able to maintain this lifestyle and maintain this year long so uh, i've just been really trying to figure that out and get it going so that when i start this journey on smackdown and you know here we are a couple weeks into it that uh i can maintain it and stay here my my i'm i'm almost 30 years old I want to be here until I'm 50, hopefully, right? So, yeah, of course. So this is the start of that. How did it feel finally making that entrance on SmackDown, knowing how far the journey has come, knowing how much you put in the work these last six months? It must have felt it must have felt great. Yeah, I, I'm a big crier. Uh, <laughs> like uh, I, I am not afraid to uh, to to cry. I'm very passionate. Um, so the whole day leading up was, you know, uh, pretty bad. Uh, luckily, my uh, my debut on SmackDown was um, pretty easy, so like I, I didn't I didn't have to get too worked up over it. But definitely the whole day, just leading up to that moment, oh yeah, the, the tears were coming. <laughs> you know, I'm not like I, I I shouldn't say I'm not. I don't know how much of a spiritual person that I am, but as someone who also recently lost their father, uh, I hope that it felt like he was watching down on you that whole time. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. And you know, through this whole journey, uh, for those that don't know, uh, I, you know, I was told on a Wednesday that I was signed to the WWE, and I was able to tell my father on that day that I made it to the WWE. And then four days later, I received a call that my father had passed away. 
And uh, ultimately, this was my father's dream for me as well. As much as it was my dream, it was his dream for me as well. And he, I, I say lucky, but he he put me into these situations and, and opportunities that I was able to take advantage of and be able to make him proud. And uh, ever since that moment, I feel like he's been there with me every step of the way. And, uh, you know, we're only going up, like I said, it, we're only going up. And now that we are at the top, we are at the peak. Uh, I feel like it's a little bit easier for him to see me. Yeah, I, I, it definitely is. It definitely is. And I'm sure that like, because of his love for wrestling, because of the fact that he was involved and fostered this love and within you, um, I'm sure it feels like you're almost doing it for the both of you at this point, you know? Oh yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So I'm glad, I'm glad that you've made I'm that man. I'm glad you got to tell him before. That's like, I can't uh, four Huge, days yeah. later. That's just like, that's rough, man. Yeah, it was, uh, it was brutal, you know, but, um, you know, and I still get upset about it, but I'm doing it. All right. So I just have to remember that. And ultimately at the end of the day is that I'm doing it. I think it's also a lesson in making sure that you're thankful of the things that come to you because like you were on this high, the highest of highs getting this signing and then you get hit with the lowest of lows and to be able to come back from that, you just got to take the, those, those positive moments, those things that are good and just uh, be, be appreciative of them. For sure. For sure. All right. Well, we have reached the final segment of the show here. I think I believe so. Uh, but I like to end every, uh, every episode of the show with a segment that I call the finishing move. There we go. Oh. Look at that. Well done. Timing wise. Great. Uh, I'll start it off with asking you, what's your least favorite move to be on the receiving end of? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I think I would have to say um, Finn Balor's coup de gras, right? Like just laying down on the ground and seeing someone just jump straight up in the air and just crush you. Uh, it, it's pretty terrifying. Ironically, you know what I mean? Uh, my finisher is kind of close to the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Very close indeed. It's, I'm glad yeah. you said that because when I ask this question to people, if I post the video on social media – the comments are always filled with people going, it's got to be the coup de gras. That looks painful just to look up at a guy about to stomp on you from the top rope. Right. Uh, the classic JR line. How do you learn to fall from a 15-foot ladder? How do you learn to get stomped on from 15 feet? You, you don't. <laughs> you definitely don't. Yeah, you, you, don't. Just, <laughs> you just hope that you have a, the abs that, that can take that kind of stomp. Yeah, at that point, you want the body fat percentage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, if you could steal any famous finishing move and make it your own without consequence, which would you choose? Well, I think it's, it has to be an obvious answer, right? I think anybody would give this answer. It's got to be the RKO. I mean, of course, I mean, it's only the coolest move ever. That's why it's just in memes and everything like if you fall you're get you're going to get imposed rko by somebody uh, you know what i mean so why wouldn't you want that opportunity yeah absolutely i think that i also think that it's, it's it's interesting that you call it the rko and not like the diamond cutter too because they are kind of the same and i think that it depends on your age and what you're going to call it there so that makes sense that you're playing oh, yeah. like smackdown versus yeah, raw and stuff you're doing orton you're doing the rko oh yeah i'm i'm boom 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 Boom. <laughs> uh, and lastly, what's the most memorable time that you've hit your finishing move on someone and why? I'm sorry. One, one more time. What, I uh, what's the most memorable time that you've hit your finishing move on someone and why? I think my biggest moment, I think, on hitting the cave-in has to be when I won the North American Championship. Uh, in the, the big ladder match, uh, if you go back, uh, it's kind of hard to see from the angle, but... Uh, I run up a ladder that's posted up against the ring, a 10 foot ladder that's like leaned up against the ring. I like ran all the way up the ladder and then jumped off the top and hit the cave in. So I think to then win the North American championship uh, at uh, what stand and deliver on WrestleMania weekend. So that, that was a huge moment. We were back in the stadium. That was the first time we were back in an arena since COVID era. So we finally got out of the little arena and, and got in front of a bunch of people. And then I finally got to stomp some guts out and head on up and get the North American championship. So just off the top of my head, I think I have to go with that one. 
Well, Cameron, I am so glad we finally got to do this. Uh, like you said on here, we've talked about it. I've been a fan of yours going back so long. And it's, you know, it's cool to see that as long as I've been following your career, you're really at the start of it now. Like you've done so much before, but now you're really at the point where I just expect nothing but good things to happen for you on the main roster. And I'm so proud of your success. Uh, and I'm just, I'm just, I can't wait to see what else you do on SmackDown. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, man, it's great talking to you, you know, and, and we're definitely going to run into each other again. So, you know, I look forward to talking to you again. Yes, definitely. Well, good luck on SmackDown. I appreciate you taking the time today and uh, keep killing it, dude. Thanks, Ryan. All right. That was my conversation with Cameron Grimes. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Super cool guy. I hope, you know, if you're smart, if you listen to this and you're smart, you're going to take this man's stock advice. This man said he bought a Porsche from his stock money so we should all take a few notes and follow in his lead i know i'm going to because buying a porsche sounds pretty cool uh before we get out of here let's do a little bit of house cleaning make sure that you guys follow wwe on fox on social media twitter facebook instagram tiktok we're on all of those platforms so make sure you guys give us a follow there and also make sure you follow the out of character podcast feed go subscribe there so you can listen to this show on the go wherever you are and if you enjoyed the shows if you're already listening on there and you enjoy the shows hook us up with a rating or a review i read them it makes me happy but also on top of just my ego it also helps people find this show it lets people know that it's worth listening to so go hook it up with a review i appreciate it very much when you do that so go do me this little solid if you can if you're already on your phone, not if you're driving, but if you're like staying still somewhere, go hook it up with a rating or a review. And also, if you're listening to this and you're not already doing so, make sure that you go subscribe to the WWE on Fox YouTube channel. That's where you can find this video, this 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 show, excuse me, this podcast on video every Wednesday early in the morning. And also clips from Raw and SmackDown, clips from this show. There's stuff in the community tab. There's everything you'd want out of a pro wrestling youtube channel so make sure you guys go subscribe to us there all right that's it i'm done officially tapping out for now until next time i'm ryan satin and this has been out of character